Today we finish our series called Finding Our Focus, which deals with the subject of our spiritual gifts. The first week we talked about our motivation, how we've each been gifted by God to help others and to glorify him. Last week we examined how to identify the areas in which we are uniquely gifted, and today we will be concluding with how to grow these gifts into a sense of calling. In our scripture passage today, the Apostle Paul clearly illustrates how we can fulfill God's calling on our lives. Not surprisingly, this involves putting spiritual gifts into action so that the church grows into fullness and maturity. Listen carefully as I read from Ephesians chapter 4. Please open your Bibles or read along in your bulletin. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. But to each one of us has been given as Christ apportioned it. Grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each does its work. Today I'm going to talk about calling, that is, life direction. And as you can see from my title, Growing a Gift into a Calling, I'm going to start with what we've covered over the last few weeks as a foundation, and that is that each of us has been gifted by God in very special and unique ways, and that God wants us to identify and discover our spiritual gifts uh, by looking at our past experiences or experimenting with ministry opportunities that are before us, and that he wants us to grow our gifts uh, into roles or into more uh, specific ministries that, that repeat over and over again. And calling uh, identif is identified with this. Sometimes when we think of, of calling, we think of that inner compulsion, that, that uh, sense of I need to be involved in something, or, or that, that, that sense that this is something I must do. Now, many of us have things we, we like to do, but we not, might not be able to say, this I must do. We may not have that sense of, of, of direction from God that, that we are to focus in on that place. And I think based on some of the, the study of spiritual gifts, part of that is because we haven't identified our gifts and we haven't been able to let them grow to the, the place where they become that sense for us. So I'm hoping today and, and through this whole series that God's going to help us with that because God has desired for these things to grow in our life. He wants us to be able to say, this is what I was designed to do. With a, with a depth of sincerity and, and with a depth of conviction. And I, I think that the, the starting point for that is to realize that every one of us have been called. There's a, a passage in Romans 11.29. It says, God never changes his mind when he gives gifts or when he calls someone. And if you look at the literal translation of that, it's, it's actually uh, the gifts and call of God are irrevocable. Another way to put that is that the gifts and call of God are a standing offer. 
It's something that God has said, I put in place in your life. There's like a seed in your life that's ready to germinate, ready to grow into something, and I'm, I'm setting it in place. And the key to that emergence of that gift and that calling is that we focus our energies on developing it in partnership with God. Very clear in the scripture that that is how it comes about. And I hope that as, as we, we think about that and identify that, we're going to be able to say, this I must do. We're going to be able to find that sense of what God is doing. Now, I know that each of us are called because our passage today speaks directly about it. It says in Ephesians 4, 1, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. This is a passage written by the Apostle Paul to the church. It is not addressed to a specific leader. Um, It is addressed to everybody in the church. And so the question we start with when we talk about calling is, what are we all called to? What are we invited into? And there are a number of things we're invited into. I'm going to talk about three that I think are very important. The first one and foremost one is we are called to Jesus Christ. We are called to him into relationship with him. And if you look at 1 Corinthians 1.9, there's actually a typo in your notes. It's not 6.9, it's 1.9. It says, he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ. Another way that that's translated is fellowship or koinonia. He's invited you to koinonia with his son, Jesus Christ. Sometimes when we hear the word fellowship, we think of just relationship. We think of, uh, and, you know, you think of having coffee with somebody, really. Let's have some fellowship back here after church. But the word koinonia, the word is much deeper than that, that, than that sense of just relationship. It is also a, a word that means partnership and participation with Jesus. And so we are invited, we are called into a partnership with Jesus, who is the head of the body. And here we have an illustration from Ephesians that's wonderful. It's about the body. And we have this, this wonderful picture of Jesus being the head who directs all that goes on in the movement of that body. And we are the church. We are the body. He is the source of, of everything we do, the director of everything we do. And we can look at different passages that talk about being the hands and feet of Jesus and many other passages. We're in partnership with Jesus and a relationship and in a wonderful partnership with him. So we're called to that very specifically and very fully. Second thing we are called to together, all of us in the church, is to love and to grow together. We're called to love and grow together. And from Ephesians 4, it's clear in that way. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. If you think that loving and caring for others in the church is not something that takes effort, well, you're fooling yourself. We are constantly dealing with the little things that annoy us about those around us. And uh, I think when you think of the, the illustration of the body, this is very apt. Because the body, our own bodies, is, a, is sort of a daily illustration for us. We need to take care of our bodies to stay healthy. We've got to feed ourselves correctly. We need to eat the right things. We need to do exercise, uh, rest. All these things are so important for the health of our body to be able to do things and be productive. When we get sick, our resources are redeployed in our body to deal with the sickness. And a lot of energy is spent on that. And I, I know those of you who have had cancer or other things like that, you see the amount of energy your body puts into fighting these types of things. I, uh, I've never been surprised that the Bible deals so thoroughly and, and fully with this issue of, of the health of the church. Uh, you see, when Paul writes, a lot of what he speaks about is this specific subject. You've got to get along with each other. You need to forgive each other. You need to bear with one another. Well, Why? Well, so we can be healthy, and we're not burning up our resources on things that distract us from the call of God. So we're called to get healthy, and we're called to give energy to being healthy and to, to resolving things that go wrong, not to, not to let them set and fester and become cancerous. 
but to deal with those things. So it's a, big, it's a very specific and strong call. Called Jesus, called to, to love and to grow together. And then thirdly, we are called to a movement. Movement of God. And I, my favorite movement, and I think the central movement, is Matthew 28. Go and make disciples of all nations. The, the Great Commission. Now, I love the word movement. Well, first of all, it relates to the body very well, doesn't it? Moving. You think, well, move. what does it do? A body moves in a coordinated manner directed by the head. And every uh, part has a role to play and a goal to fulfill when you're talking about a movement in a certain direction. I'll tell you that finding your unique part in Jesus Christ eight-word movement is the most fulfilling thing that anybody can do. I, I'm, I'm just deeply convicted about that. That this idea of going and making disciples and, uh, of all nations, and, and actually it's of all ethnic, and, and it, it's beyond just other countries, but it is crossing cultural barriers that we have. That could be age barriers, uh, the older and the younger. That could be economic barriers, someone who's different from us economically or someone who's out, who's not a, not a follower of Jesus. But when we um, figure that out, when we actually join in that movement, because there's a direction that's very clear in the Bible of the whole body of Christ in that direction, when we get our part to play in that, when we realize, I can make a disciple among someone who is maybe different than me, there is a joy that wells up within that is indescribable. And I, I, I love, I mean, our staff um, loves when we are part of the process of helping people to, to go to Jesus and to partner with him, when we help people to become healthy within the body of Christ with each other, and particularly when we help them to find that place where they can make a disciple. We, uh, we get this privilege, I mean, all of us on the staff, of having people come into our office with their eyes beaming. And they're saying, I can't believe I get to do this. This is what I got to do. I have people say this to me. And they're, and they've, and they're the people that have been working with me at Alpha, they, the, 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 the ministry to help people that are are uh, learning about Christianity, the basis of Christianity. They're, they're at the table and they're talking to people and they, they can't believe that they're doing this. And I got people that are doing our internet ministry now that come and say, I can't believe I'm doing this. This is something I have to do. I get to make a disciple from somewhere in another country. And I couldn't do that before, but I'm finding a way to do it. We got people that, that work with youth and the, the middle school kids and the younger kids. And they, they, they beam this is what I have to do. We got people who visit shut-ins. And we got people that uh, are praying. You know, they're, in the, they're, they're, they're intercessors, and they pray, and, they, and, and they, they know that they're part of this. So that's the key, is finding that. Now, the, the hard part is to figure out the process for making that happen. We all know that's important, and we all know once we find it, we, we know what it is. But how do we get there, and what's the pathway to it? Because a number of us have that, and some of us just don't know. You know, I like to do a lot of things, but I don't know what I'm called to. Well, Ephesians gives us a hint and a, and a, and a roadmap for this in a very powerful way, if we, if we can understand it. And uh, it starts with the idea that the role of a, an equipper helps to make us complete. And there's a number of roles that are mentioned here that, that are used for, meant to equip the, the church. Uh, for growth, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher are all mentioned. Now, I've had quite a journey with this passage and trying to understand it in its entirety. I, I understand it on a, on a number of levels now, it's, which has been kind of neat for me. The first level is the one that most of us have an understanding about, and that is that the, that the apostles, the 12 apostles, really laid the foundation for the church. And, of course, the prophets... Uh, were a part of that, and, and, and much of the Bible was written by prophets. And uh, even 
the evangelists of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, laid the foundation by telling the story for the church today. And that is our ultimate foundation, the Bible, to, and our starting point for all that we do. And then the Lord has given, of course, pastors and teachers among us um, to help explain all of that. And I think that most of us get that and understand that very well. And we see people who are pastors and teachers. Um, and uh, here's the thing that I've noticed, too, is that sometimes we put a lot of stake in the pastor or pastors. And um, we actually hope that maybe they're a little bit of um, apostle and prophet and evangelist as well as a pastor and teacher, you know, kind of a, a well-rounded individual who can do a lot. And um, some of us, it's, it's the, the thought is if this person is gifted and I'm listening and, and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm growing from that, that's what I need. Now, I want to present to you another perspective on that as well because that is true. We do grow from gifted people in our midst. But let me give you an, another perspective on this particular um, view of the uh, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. When um, you look at the early church and how it was established, the first thing to realize is that the apostles were ordinary people, and their distinctive that they brought was that they had been with Jesus. That was what made them noteworthy. <laughs> they had been called by Jesus. And they were called to some wonderful and important tasks. They went out and they started churches. And these churches uh, were often started in weeks, in a few weeks' time sometimes. And elders were appointed within months at times. And so by necessity, everyone in those early churches really had to play their, their part in all that had happened. And again, there were many ordinary people that were, were supernaturally called to do amazing things. Now, I got a, a taste of this for the first time when I was overseas as a missionary. And I went off in a, into Albania, which, which had very few churches at the time, and uh, I started churches. I went and started small groups of people and, and, and worked with those folks. Uh, and at the time, there was not even a Bible school in the country to train pastors. I hadn't even been to seminary at that point. But I did know one thing, and that was how to disciple. I learned that in college. I, in fact, I learned that from another college student. I was part of a campus crusade group at, at college, and another college student who was a year older than me took me under his wing, uh, showed me how to, to grow in my faith. We went through a little workbook, uh, Growing in Christ. I mean, there's, we got copies of that in the church. You can do it yourself. But he showed me how to do that, and then I took some other people through it over, through my college years, and I learned how to disciple, how to help people to grow in their faith. That was my tool set, going in to Albania. And as I was there, I, I realized something fairly quickly. I was pretty good at getting things started. And actually, I was pretty good at getting leaders who were Albanians to do things uh, and network them together. And I thought, I wonder what that gift is. I, never really, I don't know what that is even. Well, my eyes opened kind of wide when I started studying spiritual gifts, and I, I had an aha moment. What I realized in looking into the, this whole thing was that there are more than 12 apostles in the New Testament. Did you know that? There are. There's Adronicus, Junia, Silvanus, Timothy, Titus, and Barnabas. Really? Well, what were they doing? Well, Paul the Apostle trained them all, sent them out to start churches. And they did the same thing he did. Hmm. He passed on the gift. It didn't just sit there. It didn't just end with those folks. It was passed on. And then I realized, oh, this makes sense. I'm, I'm gifted to do this, this ministry because it's very necessary to start churches, to have this ministry of being able to start things and link people together. And by the way, it works very well in the context of small groups in a local church too. Go figure. And here I am here today doing that in the ministry I do here. The same kind of thing. But it's a very specific gift and role that's developed over time by practice. Now you can look at the, the role of prophet as well and try to figure that one out. A little more complicated, but it's again a truth teller, someone who's able to really 
focus in and hear what God is saying right now and use the scripture to apply it right now. We need visionary leaders around us. And more the better in the church, people that can really get a sense, what is the next thing God would like for us to do and focus on as a church? We need those kind of people in the church. And uh, we don't need just one or two. We need, a, we need a number of them. How about evangelists? Do we just need one Billy Graham? <laughs> is that all we need? <laughs> no, you know, we need a lot of them. We need people that are resonating with this idea of I want to be a bearer of good news to someone who has never heard and help them cross the line to know Jesus. We need a lot of people like that. Not just one or two, but we, we, we need to see that. We, how about pastors? Well, do you just need one pastor or five, you know, a staff? Well, why do you think we have small group facilitators? <laughs> They're pastoring people in the church because there's a need for a span of care. Or how, about, how about deacons? Um, we need people that have that, that role. Now, they might not have a title or whatever, but they have a role that fits that. They're shepherding. They're helping. Uh, elders oversee. We need, we need many elders to do that. Teachers. We need people who can teach. Now, here's the verse that uh, really opened up this for me, and it's Luke 6.40. The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained, or equipped is the actual word, will be like their teacher. So, is that saying that uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers are going to create little ones like them all over the place? Yes. Now, they may not have, have big titles, but they're going to be doing that ministry. And therefore, the growth part is as us learning how to do that in the context of those who are practicing those gifts and have grown into those gifts in, to the degree that they're consistent and more of a role. And we learn and we glean from those individuals and growth happens because we multiply ourselves everywhere. That's what God intends. That's how the body grows. So let's, let's uh, look at the implications here. Spiritual gifts can become distinctive roles. And these roles are meant to be modeled for others. We become like those that show us how to do it. Bill Hybels did, has written many books on leadership, and, and one of the things he says is great leaders are those who cast vision, build teams, fix problems, and develop emerging leaders. They do a whole lot more than just teach. They empower and they and they help people to find their place and their role in ministry now if you if you have a a gift in a certain area you'll notice something very very powerful and this goes back even to the last week we talked about how do you know you have an ability well you get attracted to others who have the same ability and you learn from them look at the areas that you really resonate with and have a, a passion for uh, if, if you've got a, a passion for, for prayer ministry, for example, you, you get with somebody else who's got a passion for prayer ministry, and all of a sudden you're just connecting. You're, you're fulfilled. Or perhaps even uh, music ministry. You know, you, you, you're, you're gifted in the ability to sing. And you're with those people, and you, just, you have this, this energy because you're learning from each other. You're improving together. Uh, I look at the, the evangelist ministry. We, when we, we started the Global Media Outreach, we grabbed a bunch of people up front who, who definitely were ready to be evangelists. And they all started zinging with each other because they had the similar gift mix. And, uh, I, you know, I, I'm, I've got that, that, that missionary thing to me. And, I, and I, I meet with a missionary. Within three or four minutes, I have made all kinds of connections, just back and forth. And we're, we're already uh, name dropping and have, you know, talked about who we know in common and all this kind of stuff. Your gift mix attracts people of similar gift mix. And when we apply ourselves and are training uh, other people, bringing them along, things happen. So when you think of a, when you think of a ministry um, that you might be involved in in the church, the first thought we have is, I just want to go out and do that ministry. I just want to do it. But, but if we are actually walking in a calling, we are... We are, are equipping other people to do it as well and finding out who has that similar gift mix and calling them to it. And, and by working together with them, our lives just start bubbling up. It's amazing. And I know many of you have experienced that. 
in, in a ministry of some sort. You get with someone else who's got that same thing and it just bubbles up. Because we were never intended to just receive. There was, there's no way that, that God intended for us to come and listen only and think that was growth. We are called to participate in that unique movement of God and find that thing that he has for us in that wonderful, broad salvation that he's doing everywhere in the world. Now, here's something I also uh, began thinking about a few years ago. When gifts and calling are talked about in the Bible, it's never really to individuals. It's always in the context of a, a group setting. Because, again, gr- gifts are, are emer- emerge from rubbing and working uh, with others that have the same gift mix and are training us and, 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 and just modeling it for us so that we can copy it. And local churches have gifts and callings too. So it's not just our in, us as individuals, but actually when, when you get into the mix of what God is doing in a church, he, he begins to direct you toward a certain uh, goal and calling at times. And I have a wonderful example of that that I, I had at the, the church I was at in California. They had developed over the years a counseling ministry that was very unique to that church. They had a, a staff person who was head, heading over the, the counseling ministry, who was a pastor. They had lay counselor training that they did, and they, they, they were serving the community. People were coming from other churches and being trained there. It was a really neat ministry. It was clear that this was something that, that was a gift that, they had give, that God had given this church for themselves. I mean, wonderful way to raise up people who could do that ministry, as well as for other, other local churches. And the the pastor came to me and he said, Rick, is there anything I can do overseas maybe we could do with this? Is there a mission trip we could do? And I gave it a little bit of thought and, and then one thing led to another and I connected them up with a ministry in the Middle East that works with underground church leaders in the Middle East. And so we organized a trip out to the Middle East with our team of lay counselors and the pastor and me and you know, a little group. We went over and we we spent time with these precious people in the Middle East uh, who came out of really horrible backgrounds. I mean, there were persecution and rejection by their families and um, just incredible things you, you couldn't imagine that they, they lived with. And, of course, they had counseling needs. And we got there, and it was like, this is what we have to do. This was such a perfect hole that it was being filled by no one else was filling it. And, and there we were, and, and this... This counseling ministry now had an international effect. It wasn't six months after that trip that the, we came back, the pastor resigned from his position and went with that ministry full-time and, and to, can continue to, to develop it and raise up people. And it just expanded his world in a way that was unbelievable because it was a, a perfect fit. It was a unique match, and it was a calling that our church was given. Now I think about our own church, and I know there's gifts and calling our own church has together. I wonder what it is. You know, I think about how we have a, a, a retirement community here, and people have time. Um, a lot of us love to travel. We'll go snowbird for four months and go on a cruise, or we'll do this or that. Wouldn't it be great if, if we were taking some of that time and applying it to mission? Uh, if we were using even more of that time and finding ways to serve in our community so more people can know Jesus. I mean, what incredible things does God have for us in our experiences and in the gifts and talents he's given our church uniquely? I, dr- I think about that all the time. And sometimes we'll get a, you know, we'll figure it out. God will show, show us something and we'll get a new ministry opportunity, a new on-ramp. And I hope there's a lot more in the coming years. We're, we're, we're starting it now and we're going to keep doing it. Um, it's going to be a roller coaster. But there's a gift and calling that we have as a church. So that's the way it goes on. But there's another thing that, and, and, that I want to just pinpoint too that I think is really important. Equipping, when you get down to the root of the word, has to do with fixing problems and making things right. Uh, it's, in Matthew 4, it talks about mending nets. It's fix what is broken. Um, this is the nets are mended. The disciples are out fishing and the nets get broken because of the fish. And they, they mend the nets and prepare them for the next catch. Uh, bringing back into alignment is the sense of a broken bone that is reset so that it can be useful again. Supplying what is lacking is related to uh, helping people who are in sin 
and coming back and, and supplying what is lacking in people's faith. Uh, bringing back into alignment is also along that lines. And then laying a foundation is from 2 Timothy, which talks about all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for, for uh, training and correcting in, and leading us in righteousness, reproof and leading us in righteousness, so that we can be equipped for every good work. So we have talked quite a bit over the last two weeks about how the thing that makes us joyful is often a sign of our gift. But let me give you another aspect of that. Sometimes our calling is based on something that needs fixing, that we see and that bothers us. So it's, it's, uh, it's actually holy discontent. <laughs> Not holy content. Holy discontent that, that often drives people. You, uh, you look at some of the stories in the Old Testament, and here, here you have Moses who... Uh, was so, so enraged he killed a man and had to go into the wilderness and, uh, and eventually God called him to go back and take the people out. But it was holy discontent that started off his calling. You have Jesus here in Matthew 9. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And it was that need that he saw that moved him to action. So as we are thinking about gifts, we, we not only need to think about what do I enjoy doing, but we also need to think about what is it that needs fixing that maybe God is calling me to mend? What is it? What, is, what does he want me to equip? You know, I'm equipping more people to do what I do. If you've got a gift, use it and give it to other, other people. Now, I want to give you a, a, an example of that, and so I'd like for Victor Lancheros to come up. And uh, where I was trying to think of someone that could, could illustrate this a little more fully for us. And Vic, Victor's a really good example because he's been a, a coach for over 27 years. And then has been helping out Tony's youth ministry for, for nine years. And recently was made an elder two years ago. And has a real heart for kids. And I think that for you is one of the things that really moves you forward to discover your gift in this area. So can you share a little bit about that? Sure. Good morning. Um, and that it was that... The children is what uh, uh, brought my attention and made me think. I started coaching. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm married. My wife uh, Julie and I have uh, three uh, kids. Um, been coaching for the last 27 years or so. Uh, soccer, uh, the love of my life, as I thought, um, other than my wife, of course, um, and our kids. Um, started coaching because of the love for the game. Uh, five, six years after or I, that I was into it here in SQUIM, I started realizing that um, my love for the game had opened my eyes a little bit more and that God was trying to do something through me. Um, I started listening to the kids and I started seeing that these kids were, some of them were broken. their past uh, or their young life was really hard. Uh, some of them didn't have a father, some of them didn't have a mother, some of them lived with their grandparents, uh, having a really, really hard time. And, and it was hard for them to, to deal with it, but they didn't want to talk to anybody about it. Uh, so I think that God was working through me or trying to say, you got to help these kids. And through my support, uh, through my um, patience uh, and my guidance to them, I was able to help or give them some relief at least for the time being and then hopefully on through, uh, as, through their life as they, as they lived on. Um, so my, my, my love for the, for the game changed for the, for the love of the children, the love for the kids. Uh, I started uh, um, not knowing, not realizing really that this, is, this, is, this was my calling. Uh, I, I thought that I was doing it because I love the game, because uh, I, I just like to play the game. But no, God had something in mind. God was telling me that my real love is the Jews, is, is the kids. It's trying to bring them up, trying to, trying to guide them, trying to give them character, uh, trying to... Uh, help and live a better life. Uh, therefore, I got involved with, uh, with the youth group here at the church. Um, 
and then uh, I started uh, working with Daniel for a few couple of years, and then Tony came in, and we started going to Mexico, doing all these uh, mission trips down to Mexico, and the kids, and trying to help the kids, the same thing, the same, not the same kids, but uh, different kind of kids, but with the same problems, uh, the same um, uh, weight on their hearts, uh, something that they that they could not get rid of until they found out that if they trust in God, that if we all have faith in God, um, He will guide us and give us the strength to go through this heartaches and, and go through life uh, in a better way, in a healthier and happier life way. Um, after that, um, after becoming a youth uh, leader, uh, God kept working in me, and uh, I was honored to be asked to become a youth elder, uh, another way of helping the youth. Never, never in my life I, would, I thought that I would be uh, involved with the church much less become a, a youth group leader or an elder for the church. Um, but he, as I said, he, he works in mysterious ways, and, and he um, has guided me and has given me um, the ability to, to deal with the kids. And we all, as Rick was saying, we all have a gift, a God-given gift, and that we need to explore, that we need to work hard on, that we need to really, really develop in order to try to help our kids or try to help our brothers and sisters. Um, so, and uh, I know that all of you have gifts. I know that um, all of you have time to do, um, to, to, to do what God wants you to do, to accept, to realize that calling that has God has for you. So please, please get involved in any, any uh, ministry in the church or in the community um, because God needs our help. He, he put us here to help our brothers and sisters. Um, and always remember, it's not all about us. It's about God. So let's um, glorify God with our thoughts, our words, and our uh, actions. Um, thank you. Thank you. That's cool. Well, I'm going to wrap up here, and I really appreciate Victor, Victor sharing that and, and giving us a good example of, of how this really works. As I conclude here, I, I'm going to let you fill in here. When you find it, feed it. When you find your gift, feed it. 2 Timothy 1.6 says, I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift that God gave you. Now, a lot of things might prompt us to action. But the question I have today is, is, is what is that one thing that really won't let you go? What is it that's in your mind that either gives you joy or gives you discontent? that you think about a lot. The Bible's very clear. Fan it into flame. And sometimes we have doubts around that particular thing. How can God use me to do anything here? Well, press through the doubts. Fan it into flame. In uh, 1 Timothy, it goes on, and it says, do not neglect your gift. So we can have a gift and we can neglect it. But he's telling him, you know, apply yourself, Timothy. Give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourself into your tasks so that everyone will see your progress. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right. What a great encouragement to stay focused and, and trust that God has something unique for each one of us. He has something unique for me to do and his wonderful movement that he's doing. And we know that the secret to a fulfilled life is to find out what God has uniquely designed us to do and then just to, to do it for his glory, that he gets the attention. When uh, 
I think about all of this. I love Proverbs 4.23. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. God always speaks at our heart level. And he looks at our motives and he looks at our passions. He looks at our fears. And he has things he wants to awaken in us. And if we've been listening, he's been, uh, been doing that among us and in our midst. So I'd encourage you to, to take a step back and not let that just disappear. <laughs> if there's something that's been stirring in you over the last few weeks, write it down, don't let it disappear, and take that little ember you got and fan it and see what happens. Fan it into flame. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we don't want to waste our lives. and We don't want to waste our time. It is a most precious thing to know our gifts and our calling in life and to be able to say, this is something I am uniquely suited for. This is something I must do. Lord, some of us have identified a, a passion or a dream already and we're wondering how you wanna, want us to fan it into flame. Maybe we have a holy discontent about something that needs fixing or, or mending. And Lord, I pray you would put us to use and that we would no longer stay on the sidelines. Lord, I also pray that you would help us to find models of those who, who are using their gifts right around us and help us to find those people and to relate to them and to, to grow along with them, to, uh, to be part of what you're doing. Lord, help us to be connected with other people. And uh, may we never say, I'm not able to do this or that. Of course we're not able to do this or that, but you are a big God. You're the God of miracles. And you give your gifts and your calling as a standing offer. They're irrevocable. They're ready to germinate whenever we are ready to trust in you. So Lord, give us examples to follow and, and uh, help us to have faith to walk in the things you've given us. Help us find avenues for that. Help the staff here to find avenues and ideas. Give, give us vision. Give us ideas. And uh, give us ways to, to walk into those things and not let it be theory in our lives, but reality. So we trust you to do this. In Jesus' name, amen.